All right. Hello, everyone. It's Ariel Hawani flying solo once again. It seems like by the time these pay-per-views end, no one really likes me anymore. No one wants to hang out and talk about them anymore, recap them. So I'm here flying solo, but here to recap a very entertaining, a very interesting night, a very newsworthy night for the Ultimate Fighting Championship. UFC 260 is officially in the books. By now, you probably know that there is a new undisputed UFC heavyweight champion. His name is Francis Nganou. He is le predateur. He knocked out Stipe Miocic in the second round. What a performance. What a win. What a what an improvement since January of 2018. We have to talk about that. We have to talk about uh, Vicente Luque's big win over Tyron Woodley. Sugar Sean O'Malley looking great in his return against Thomas Almeida. We'll talk about all that and a whole lot more here on the wrap-up show. But again, let's start with the main event. So uh, the first time they fought in January of 2018 in Boston, Massachusetts. You've heard us talk about this fight ad nauseum at this point. Uh, Francis came out strong. It was my round of the year, the first round was, and he landed some big shots, but Stipe took those shots. And then, of course, he got really tired. He gassed out and essentially did nothing for the next four rounds. Since then, had that fight against Derek Lewis. His confidence was shot. He was booed out of the T-Mobile arena, and then he went on this amazing four-fight winning streak. None of those fights went longer than 71 seconds. And so he finally gets this title shot after campaigning, after being frustrated, and we were all wondering, okay, is he a different man? He's with a different team. He's with different coaches, Eric Nixick and uh, Dewey Cooper, to be exact. Um, and, and he's living in Las Vegas now. He's not living in France anymore. But is he truly different? And what happens if the fight goes past the first round? Well, this fight went past the first round. But in the first round, he was aggressive but poised. He was patient. He was measured. He was landing big shots, and Stipe, to his credit, was taking those shots, but it just felt like a different kind of Francis, a Francis who was using other tools in his arsenal. The leg kick, very impressive. Stuff to take down, very impressive. Even tried to be aggressive with the wrestling of uh, uh, in his own right. And so he... he he even used his wrestling, and people were questioning, why are you trying to wrestle the man? But the way he got out and escaped from Stipe's shot was very impressive. Daniel Cormier giving him a lot of credit for that as well. And so it, it definitely seemed, going into the second round, that this was a different guy, that everything he had told us about himself as a fighter was true in 2021. You know, he said on Thursday he didn't recognize the guy who fought in 2018. He didn't even watch that fight hardly leading up to this fight. And, you know, at first you're kind of thinking, oh, well, that's a little weird. But then you see him in this fight and you're like, yeah, this is a different man. This is a man who uh, seemed like he was destined for greatness to become a UFC champion. It felt like this was the coronation of Francis Ngannou. And, and, and what a freaking performance. And then in the second round, uh, rocks Stipe. Stipe then rocks him, gets aggressive, gets a little too confident, and then he nails Stipe with that left hook, an amazing left hook, right on the money, and then drops him. It was uh, it was shades of Rashad Evans and Leona Machida. Threw the extra shot on the ground, probably not necessary, but I'm sure he wanted to put that exclamation point on uh, what has been a very crazy journey for this man, not only in the UFC, but throughout his entire life. So it's his 12th knockout win, 10th in the UFC. He was the favorite going into the fight, and, and finally he gets that gold. It's a beautiful moment for a guy who, like I said, has overcome a lot and uh, is just an absolute specimen. I mean, you look at him in there, the guy is gigantic. He's got muscles on top of muscles, incredible power. This is the first time since Brock Lesnar that the UFC has a heavyweight champion who will capture the imagination of the mainstream public. This is what you want from a heavyweight champion, uh, a guy who will be intimidating, who will sell a fight, and who will also knock people out, and this man knocks people out. And so he did so tonight um, in a fantastic performance, a well-rounded impressive, patient, poised, measured performance. Uh, he was a different man who fought uh, Stipe Miocic back in 2018, and he deserves to be the heavyweight champion. And, and so on the flip side, I can't help but think of Stipe, and I can't help but think of his legacy. Here's a guy who uh, is now turning 39 in August, who has done it all, has beaten them all, is the most decorated and successful champion in UFC heavyweight history, and, you know, one thing that I don't think was talked about enough going into this fight was the effect that the three fights against Daniel Cormier had on this man. You know, we love to talk about, 
Rory McDonald and Robbie Lawler. We love to talk about Cain Velasquez and JDS, how those fights changed the men involved. I don't feel like we talked enough about how the three fights against Daniel Cormier may have changed Stipe Miocic. Remember, he was knocked out in the first round of the first fight, went four rounds in the second fight, a fight that he was losing early on, and then went five rounds with DC back in August. Now, they were spread out over you know two plus years, but you don't go what, 20 plus rounds with arguably one of the best fighters of all time, certainly in the higher weight classes, and not leave a piece or two of yourself in the cage. And I think that Stipe left a piece or two of himself in the cage against Daniel Cormier. And look, I'm not trying to take anything away from from Francis here. Francis earned that fight. He may have won that fight, regardless of if the trilogy with DC happened or not. But I do think that when you consider his age, when you consider the three fights that he just endured, with uh, with DC, the eye injury, I mean, the, the, the wear and tear on his body. You can't help but think if maybe this is the beginning of the end or even the end of Stipe Miocic's career. This is a guy who doesn't love uh, the limelight, doesn't love the media, doesn't love being a prize fighter other than the actual fighting that's involved. Uh, you wonder if he's really going to want to go through the, you know, the journey of getting back to the title. And so you can make a strong case right now. Uh, Stipe Miocic probably deserves another crack at the heavyweight title. I mean, he's now 1-1 with uh, Francis Ngannou. I mean, why wouldn't he deserve another crack at him? But it doesn't seem like the UFC is going to be uh, all that interested in giving him that third crack against uh, Francis um, obviously, you have the John Jones fight out there, which we will get to in a second. And even if the John Jones fight doesn't materialize anytime soon, you have uh, Derek Lewis waiting in the wings. Now, uh, is Derek Lewis a, a huge player in all of this right now? Well, certainly his last few fights would signal the fact that he's a massive player in the heavyweight division. But let's not forget the first fight against Francis Ngannou back in, what was it, 2018 was one of the most lackluster fights in in UFC history. So I don't know if they're going to be that quick to try to run that one back, although I do feel very strongly that this fight would play out a lot differently and be a lot more exciting than the first fight was around three years ago. But now let's talk about John Jones for a second because this is a fight that we were thinking about last summer. It never materialized. It never came to fruition. And now all of a sudden... Uh, this fight is over. Francis is the champion, and John's talking about show me the money. And of course, I want to fight in the heavyweight division, but I also want to get it paid. And the question that I have is, why didn't they figure this all out with John over the past year? Like now, we're going to start negotiating this now. We knew that he was moving up. We knew he vacated the title. Why are we negotiating this now with John Jones? And so I hope that this fight gets made. I think John Jones versus Francis Ngannou would be one of the Biggest fights in UFC history, one of the most lucrative fights in UFC history. I mean, could you imagine John Jones, the greatest light heavyweight champion of all time, moving up to heavyweight to fight that man, Francis Ngannou? That's massive, massive box office right there. That's a huge fight. You have to figure out how to make that fight happen. And that sucks for Stipe, and that sucks for Derek Lewis, but you have to figure out. This is too perfect of a fight. You cannot waste John Jones' heavyweight debut against anyone else. Francis is the champ. This will capture the imagination of the mainstream public, you have to figure out how to make that fight happen. If it doesn't happen, it's a failure on the UFC's part, on John Jones's part, on everyone's part. You gotta figure it out. And so that's the fight that obviously has to happen next for uh, Francis and for John. Maybe Derek Lewis waits. Maybe he fights a a surreal gun. Maybe he fights a Stipe if Stipe wants to come back. By the way, Stipe versus Derek Lewis would make a hell of a lot of sense. I just wonder if Stipe wants to go through that journey again and get back to the heavyweight title, and then only to fight a Francis Ngannou again. He hasn't said that he wants to be done. Um, I asked him about this in our pre-fight interview, but 39, doesn't love the limelight, the fights with DC, the wear and tear. I wonder. I wonder how many more times we'll see Stipe. Maybe once, maybe twice. I don't know if much more than that. All I know is Francis versus John Jones is going to be a huge fight that has to get made for this summer or early fall And uh, it will be very disappointing if we have to endure that whole drama that we endured last year with uh, the contract talks and then end up with nothing. This is the kind of fight that, you know, boxing fans dream of and that doesn't happen because of negotiations. Historically, these are the fights that the UFC gets done. I think they'll get it done. I think John Jones is sincere in his desire to fight at heavyweight. Obviously, Francis will want this fight. Let's get it done. So congratulations to Francis Ngannou. What a performance. What a night. 
What a finish. What a specimen. What a guy. I mean, and congratulations to his team as well. Uh, Eric Nixick and, uh, and, 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 and Dewey Cooper. What they did with this man, nothing short of amazing. And they deserve a lot of props and a lot of credit as well. Let's talk about the co-main event, Vicente Luque against Tyron Woodley, the fight of the night. Woodley was very aggressive. Uh, he was the guy who we wanted to see in the last three fights. Uh, unfortunately, he got a little too overzealous, a little too aggressive, and eventually was stopped in the first round via Darce Choke. Um, he got rocked, and, and, and it looked like he was going to get actually finished on the feet, and then eventually went down to the mat, and, and Luque is so good on the mat. He's so good everywhere. This guy is just 29, and... Uh, other than in his UFC debut, which he lost, he has only lost to Leon Edwards and Wonderboy Thompson at 170 pounds. He is a very tough, he is a very gritty, he is an always game fighter who deserves to be talked about when we talk about the top guys at 170 pounds. Unfortunately for Woodley, now four losses in a row in what was the last fight on his UFC deal. Uh, I don't know if we'll see him back in the UFC ever again. Dana White didn't want to officially say that, but it seemed like he was sort of leaning in that direction. It's sad to see him go out like this. I think he'll continue to fight. I just don't think it will be in the UFC. And so all the best to Tyron Woodley, a guy who I don't think gets the credit that he deserves for being one of the very best in the history of the sport, especially in the welterweight division. You know, we talk about Usman and GSP. Usman's not at the GSP level just yet. Usman's at the Tyron Woodley level. He's at the Pat Miletic level. He's at the Matt Hughes level. Woodley's in that conversation and I know he's polarizing with the rap music and the, the interviews at times. This man was a great fighter, is still a great fighter, just isn't in the upper echelon anymore of the UFC 170-pound division. But could he be in the upper echelon? Could the guy who fought tonight be in the upper echelon in the PFL's welterweight division or Bellator's welterweight division? Yeah, I think so. Um, it was clear he wanted to be aggressive. It was clear he was trying to get a finish to show people that he wasn't the guy who fought in the last three fights. Unfortunately, that ended up costing him. He wins the fight of the night, but live by the sword, die by the sword. Um, so tough to see a veteran, a good guy, go out like that. But congratulations to Vicente Luque, who called out Nathan Diaz afterwards, um, a guy who's itching to get back in there. I know Nathan is is interested in the Leon Edwards fight. I know Leon is interested in that fight as well. I know they're trying to do Leon Edwards versus Colby Covington. If they do that fight, do they do Vicente Luque versus Nathan Diaz? You can make worse fights than that. Is that the kind of name that Nathan Diaz is looking for? I'm not sure, but uh, credit to Vicente Luque for shooting his shot. Uh, let's talk about a guy who had a pretty nice shot, pretty nice form, nice little turnaround J by Sugar Sean O'Malley after his win over Thomas Almeida. Should have probably finished him in the first round, ended up finishing him in the third round, uh, kind of went for the walk-off. The referee, Mark Smith, didn't want to give him the walk-off, so it took a little longer, but the big story was O'Malley's back, looked phenomenal, looked on point, looked crisp, looked game, uh, didn't seem to have any you know, ill effects from the loss to uh, Marlon Vera. The confidence is back. The swagger is back. All that stuff and more is back. He is, uh, once again, an interesting player at 135 pounds. Would have been nice to see him finish the fight in the first round, uh, but eventually he, he was able to finish the fight in the third. So uh, don't really have any problems with that. And and I, I wasn't ready to give up on Sugar Sean O'Malley, to be honest, uh, after the loss to Marlon Vera. Marlon Vera is a really good fighter. And I think that people should recognize that. And O'Malley's still pretty young in his career. And and I know that we have Rob Font and Cody Garbrandt coming up. Um, I don't know, maybe a fight. Dominic Cruz would be kind of wild. I'm looking at the rankings right now. Um, he is not in the top 15 as of right this moment. So there's a lot of names out there. Cody Stamen, Jimmy Rivera, Rafael Sunsal, Pedro Munoz. A litany of guys for uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley to fight. So... We'll see what happens there. But that was a really impressive performance by him. Also on the main card, we had uh, Miranda Maverick with a nice unanimous decision win over Jillian Robertson. She is definitely going to be a player at 125 pounds. She won the uh, Invicta Phoenix Rising Series tournament thing um, and has looked good in the UFC thus far. So I think she has a bright future ahead of her. She improved to... 11 and 2, and also Jamie Malarkey with a tremendous finish of Kama Worthy in the first round. Just 46 seconds. It was all it took for Jamie Malarkey in the first round of that fight against uh, Kama Worthy. Also, of note, Alonzo Menafield with the Von Flu choke win over uh, Mr. Fabio Cherant. 
uh, Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov with a unanimous decision win over Jared Gooden, uh, Mikhail Oleksheshuk with the win as well, split decision win, Omar Morales with the unanimous decision win, and how about Quebec's own Marc-André Barrio, who uh, kicked things off with a nice win over Abu Azaitor, a third round KO win, TKO win, excuse me, over Abu Azaitar, so a nice win for the Canadian who improved to 12-4. and four. But of course, the big news Francis Ngannou is the new UFC heavyweight champion. He defeats Stipe Miocic. Miocic's run comes to an end after his two wins over Daniel Cormier. Now we are in the Predator era. This was the era that we thought was going to begin in 2018. Are we going to see that big John Jones fight later this year? It would be one of the biggest heavyweight fights, biggest fights in UFC history. Or will the uh, contract negotiations rear their ugly head again? We'll find out. UFC is off uh, this weekend coming up, April 3rd. They are off. They're back on April 10th with Darren Till versus Marvin Vittori on ABC. Then April 17th, Robert Whitaker versus Kevin Gaslam. And then the pay-per-views go back on the road. And Dana White said at the post fight press conference, he hopes that this will be the last pay-per-view at the Apex for quite some time, if not ever. They're going to Jacksonville April 24th. They're going to Houston May 15th. And then uh, we've got June 12th, TBD. July 10th, hopefully back in Las Vegas. And he said he is still hoping that that will be Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier 3. That fight is not done, but that's what they're hoping will happen. All right, I'm out of time. It is late. I'm doing these by myself. No one likes me anymore. But you know who does like me? Daniel Cormier. I'll be back on Monday right here. Same spot as always. We'll recap it all. DC and Hawani, you know the time. You know the place. You know the drill. Hope you enjoyed the fights. Hope you enjoyed our coverage. Thanks for watching as always. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.